কত দূরে চার চার বারের প্রথম যখন লড়লেন কত দূরে আপনার কত দূরে মাইল কি তিন মাইল কত এই তিন মাইল দূরে আপনার বাড়ি ছিল স্যার এরপরে ভাঙতে ভাঙতে ছোট 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 এখন এখানে এই বছরে ছোট নিয়ে শুধুমাত্র নদী ভাঙানোর কারণই আপনি ছোট ছিল অন্য কোনো কারণ না অন্য কোনো কারণ ইমাজিন ইউ লিভড ইন আ প্লেস দ্যাট ওয়াজ রিপিটেডলি ডিস্ট্রয়েড হাউ উড ইউ ফিল how would you manage what solutions would you seek these are just some of the key questions discussed in my phd research into climate migration at the university of new south wales in sydney australia as one of three international case studies this documentary features forced migration in bangladesh As a densely settled low-lying coastal country, Bangladesh is well known for its vulnerability to the effects of climate change. Approximately 50 million people live within 5 meters of sea level. However, the country is also well known for the resilience of its people in the face of frequent disasters. Before coming to Bangladesh for my PhD research, I had visited the country in 2008. compiling a disaster report for the humanitarian organization World Vision International. Now, I wanted to return to some of the same places to better understand how things were changing. With the assistance of some World Vision colleagues and with the aid of an MAF turbine float plane, which reduced a whole day of traveling time to less than an hour, I returned to the coastal community of Tajamuddin in Bola, Bangladesh's largest island. And with a bit of luck, I even tracked down the two key informants who I had interviewed a few years before. <laughs> What they told me stunned me. This is the other old man. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do you other at Noishali Namulu Jan 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 is तीन One student told us how the very land of his school had eroded away only a few months ago. Ami Muhammad Shimon. Er shabhabik edik kotha bolo, school er naam bolo. Amar odishik. Edike takaiye bolo, nishchit tumi shabhabik edike takaiye amader boltecho tumi. Amar shikta protishthaner naam Doritadpur Mustafizur Rahman Registry Primary Vidyal. Ebong amar protom class eta one class. Acha. शिक्षक 
In this place, erosion even seemed to outpace Google Earth satellite map updates, which are accurate to three meters. According to the blue dot, we were standing next to the school building. However, evidently there was no school building to be seen anymore, and we were standing literally at the edge of the water. According to the legend, there should have been more than 100 meters between us and the coast. It was quite incredible. <laughs> Standing in the very place where only six months ago there used to be a school, I try to imagine the impact that this would have had on Muhammad Sumon and on the children, their education, their ability to maintain their education, their future, and so on. And of course, the actual cost involved in physically relocating the school somewhere else. After a few hours of walking around the community I had visited only a few years earlier, I felt completely disoriented. It was impossible to recognize any of the coastal features from my previous visit. It looked and felt like a different place altogether. <laughs> so this is something I found while walking along through the community that nothing looks the same way that it did in 2008. Many people said to us that they've actually had to move house three to four times in the past few years alone. And at the same time I felt impressed by the enormous resilience and resourcefulness of the affected people we met. People are adapting through necessity. They're not adapting because they've been told what to do, they're adapting because they have to. In the past three years, approximately 25,000 people have actually had to move from this piece of land um, where I'm standing. Well, they have moved from very close to here. In fact, uh, the land they were living on is actually out in the sea at the moment. Further up the coast, People told us that an entire union comprising several villages had eroded away and disappeared from the map. Standing on a bridge that now led nowhere but to the past, community members mentioned roads, areas, villages, and even entire unions that now no longer existed, except in their memories. <laughs>
Changing the GPS view on Google Earth from map view to satellite view seemed to reveal that in this area a massive amount of land had been lost fairly recently. Near about 35 square kilometer total area of this union. Some people migrate to Noakali, some people migrate to the there are so many small islands around the area. Those people migrate there. Some people migrate to capital, some people migrate to Nuakali, another district town. Some capital, that is Dhaka. Dhaka. Okay. And some people migrate there, Burhanuddin. Yeah. To this area? Yeah, this yeah. area. According to the people's account, the bridge that now pointed to the open sea of the estuary used to be the road to Tajamudan, the place of the eroded school. According to these community members, about 35 square kilometers of land had been lost to erosion, and more than 40,000 people made homeless. I tried to imagine what it would feel like to live in a place that won't exist next year. How would you cope? We were told that the government had built a shelter for the displaced people to house them, but that in light of the advancing water, the buildings had already been abandoned. Along the water's edge, we could also see some concrete slabs that were intended to slow down the land loss. Although no one seemed overly confident that this measure would do more than buy more time. What seemed obvious was that people were leaving the land in droves. Returning to Dhaka and then traveling on to Chittagong, I tried to see if we could find people from Bola who had migrated into these massive cities. How were they getting on now? Forced migration is evidently a fact of life for countless Bangladeshis. According to the World Bank, between the years 1980 and 2000, more than 37 million Bangladeshis were made homeless by disasters. Although I'm not exactly sure how such a number could be verified, I interpret the figure as a staggering reminder that forced migration is not a new phenomenon in Bangladesh. Arriving into these congested megacities, migrants encounter a plethora of challenges. Conducting focus group interviews in slums in Dhaka and Chittagong, I also encountered dozens of people from Bola Island, many of whom had left their villages because of erosion. Everybody in this slum is a migrant. Most are here because of floods or cyclones. I migrated from Bola, where a partial union eroded. The main reason I migrated is erosion. Rent in the slum is expensive, one room is 2,200 taka, two rooms are 4,000 taka. Discounting city-states, Bangladesh is already the most densely settled nation in the world. With a population of 160 million people and an average 1,200 people crowding together on each available square kilometer of land, this relatively small country is home to more people than live in all of Russia combined. According to the World Bank, each day an estimated 1,000 new migrants, mostly poor, arrive in Dhaka, making Bangladesh's capital the fastest growing megacity in the world. 
Again and again I heard similar stories of both human hardship and resilience. We've been visiting uh, the slum areas in Chittagong for the last several days, conducting interviews, trying to find out what motivates people to migrate from one area to another. And one of the themes that has come up in the last several days the theme of education. I'm not sure you're able to appreciate this fully, but what we see here is a number of children, young children who would normally be at school, just congregating in the streets. Throughout field work, I was surprised, time and again, to see so many school-aged children not attending school. It appeared that numerous parents simply could not afford to send their children to school and instead sent them to work and contribute income so the family could make meager ends meet. During one focus group interview in a Chittagong slum, which included dozens of children, it emerged that not a single child present was attending school. UNICEF Bangladesh estimates that there are more than 4 million working children aged 5 to 14 in Bangladesh and that half of all child laborers do not attend school at all. According to the UN, the mean length of school attendance is less than five years. <laughs> Unless education can be made available free and compulsory for all, working children will continue to get trapped in low-paying and low-skilled jobs, perpetuating their cycle of poverty. More often than not, vulnerabilities in urban slums seemed far greater than the problems in rural communities which had triggered the migrations in the first instance. <laughs> Living in squalid conditions, many migrants have no other choice but to fight for subsistence survival in conditions which some researchers have described as subhuman, meaning below basic human decency and dignity. Resilience grows out of necessity in many cases. And people migrate for numerous different reasons into an urban area. But frequently they're moving from one situation of extreme risk and vulnerability into another one that is slightly different but yet equally risky and, and in many cases creates them more trouble uh, than where they've come from. It appears that lack of basic education is a key factor limiting options for daily wage laborers and their families. With numberless people struggling severely, for their basic daily livelihoods. The parcel is 5 taka per kg and sell 6 taka per kg. 
The challenges of urban vulnerability are huge, uh, especially for the children. When you look at children growing up in the, in the squalor uh, that surrounds them, you see a number of, number of things that uh, need addressing. Many of them are, can be addressed through education. And that's something that we have considered as a, a very important area to focus on, is, is addressing the next generation's understanding of how to reduce risk, how to build up resilience in communities. I also had the sense that many migrants would prefer to return to their communities of origin if they had a realistic prospect to find work. I also had the strong impression that education was essential if people were to be enabled to better understand the changes taking place in their natural environments. In Dhaka, I met with Dr. Maminul Haq Sharkar to learn about processes of erosion and accretion. It was interesting for me to discover that anecdotal eyewitness accounts of community members in Bola largely agreed with the satellite-based scientific measurements of morphological changes. In some places, you can... Is there six kilometers? Six kilometers. Six kilometers, yeah. There is a little... Uh, the river entered into eroded six kilometers. In the same place, is six kilometers here. That's extraordinary. Yeah, yes, yes. Very high rate. Eh? This is a polar island. Now, red is the uh, erosion and blue is the accretion from 1973 to 2008. And extent of uh, erosion is here in the red. This length maximum is uh, six kilometers. So every year. In this uh, magnetic area, the erosion is in the scale of 100 square kilometer. On the other hand, accretion is a little bit more. Say, if it is 100 erosion, then accretion is 120 kilometer. We are uh, during the last three decades, we are getting land nearly 16 to 20 kilometers per year. And. In this area, in the Bola district, the erosion and the equation are balanced almost. Dr. Sharka also explained that before displaced people can settle in areas where sedimentation has produced new land, expensive embankments have to be built to offer these coastal lands the needed protection from tides and storm surges. In short, coastal areas take decades to become safe and productive. We cannot push the people or force the people to live there because they are not safe there. Uh, because a lot of storm surge possibilities there. And if the large storm surge came in, then a lot of people, hundreds of people will wash away. So, for relocating the people, first we should build the uh, bouldering, embankment dikes to protect them from the storm surges and cyclones. Then we can allow them to live there. Otherwise, we will push them in their high risk zone. Trying to gauge the precise contribution climate change is having on migration in Bangladesh seems like an impossible endeavor. Migrants are so evidently dealing with multiple and interrelated problems, and isolating out climate change seems virtually impossible. However, absence of evidence about a problem does not imply evidence of absence of a problem. In other words, just because it's impossible to quantify the precise contribution of climate change to human movement, 
it doesn't mean that it's not a real and growing problem. The following analogy by a Bangladeshi government official aptly illustrates how climate change is increasingly adding to the cumulative burden shouldered by millions of Bangladeshis. Let's say, for example, one person is able to carry only 40 kg on his shoulders. That's his limit. And he is a poor man. Now, on the top of that, I come and I give him one kilogram on top of that. So now the question will be, who is responsible for killing him? Is this the 40 kilograms he was already carrying on his head? Or the one kilogram I have now put on the top of that? What we've found basically in the last several days is that while climate change cannot always be neatly identified or isolated in the mix of factors that prompt people to migrate, what always seems to emerge is that poverty is one of the strong themes implicated in prompting and pushing people to migrate. Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world. Approximately half the population live below the international poverty line of $1.25 per day. 80% struggle for survival on less than $2 per day. It is therefore not surprising that poverty is strongly implicated in the movement of people. The other thing we've discovered is that poverty is often caused by a lack of education. Many of the respondents have indicated that their highest level of educational attainment is a primary school at best. Many, in fact, indicated that they never attended school at all. What seemed to emerge during fieldwork is the correlation between very low levels of educational attainment and extreme levels of poverty. Therefore, the two issues of poverty and education seem strongly interrelated and cannot be meaningfully discussed in isolation of each other. Observation following the visits and the discussions that we had with the displaced populations, they are more push factors than pull factors that lend them moving. The tipping points seem to be revolving around the loss of land, which is their main source of livelihood. While the populations in Bola looked extremely vulnerable, their living conditions to me looked more calmly than the living conditions that I found in the slums. Preparing for a better tomorrow through education, while meeting the needs of today through livelihoods, seems to emerge as the predominant challenge facing development organizations and policy makers today. The ability for people to have new skills, to develop new ways of working is very important. New skills for new livelihood opportunities. In summary, if lack of education forecloses options, uninterrupted education will raise resilience and create new opportunities. Education thus emerges as no regrets good development practice that will pay dividends irrespective of which climate change scenario will ultimately materialize in Bangladesh. <laughs>